And we are back. How's it going? It's Mixed Las Vegas at the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino. We're here with Phil Hack. Nice shirt, Phil. Thank you. It's very Vegasy. <laughs> and Steve Sanderson, all Hi. the way from uh, Bristol. That's right. Bristol How's it in going? England. Uh, good, thank you. Yes, just about adapted to the time zone change now. Is it? Yeah. Bristol's a small town, right? Uh, it's small. I don't know. It's got about a million people there. It's not that small. It's about small. the size of the Mandalay Bay. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. Yeah. Very cool. Much fewer cool. shops, though. <laughs> fewer shops? <laughs> yeah. The Mandalay Bay has more shops than Bristol. Probably. Yeah. Awesome. Probably. Very cool. You get, so you're stealing one of our 90s? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the goo just left. Apparently we have him to thank for the yellow screen of death, so that was exciting. Yeah, that was yeah. good to know. I appreciate that. Yeah. When did you start working at Microsoft, Steve? November the 15th, uh, four months ago or so. Four months ago. Yep, five, six months ago, something okay. like that. Okay, so Phil, we've got scaffolding now. Mm -hmm. How did that? How did that come up? I know that I demoed some scaffolding stuff at, at PDC in October. Ebo had prototypes in September or something like that that he you know throw over to play with, and I abused David Fowler and he and I built this thing. Then Steve came to work in November and somebody said Steve will do anything and gave him <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and now suddenly we're shipping some scaffolding and then there's even more extensible scaffolding you can bring down from NuGet to extend what we just released. How did this come up? How did this happen? Was it all just I, luck? I think you just told the whole was story. Was it all luck? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Or was this your master plan, Phil, total, as total the PM? Skill. Was just, it master plan? From the very beginning, even before I joined Microsoft, I knew that someday I would write a uh, ad controller dialogue that does scaffolding that yeah. integrates with something that Steve Sanderson would write later. It is the natural conclusion of ASP.NET MVC. It's Absolutely. sort of the, the end goal of it all, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, will we eventually extend MVC so that I can drag a data grid over and then bring the Northman database in? And it'll just... Oh, good oh. idea. Full circle. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, writing inline SQL is the thing to do now. Actually, we're pretty close. If you call the uh, webgrid dot uh, <laughs> grid or, and pass in some data, and it generates a table with paging, sorting, all that stuff. So how does that? How does it work, though? You're the PM. You've got devs that work on MVC. He's in England, and we've got NuGet. What's the interaction like for the work that he does, the work that you do, and the work that your devs do on MVC to bring it to something that we ship today? Uh, so for the most part. Uh, I'm in charge of you know kind of trying to drive the overall planning for it, but uh, you know it's a collaborative effort with the lead devs and the QA. Uh, and then um, what happened with this particular release is that we had just released MVC3 RTM in January, and then uh, you know we had this great idea to let's do another release. You know, uh, as a lot of people say, MVC version three is often when Microsoft gets things right, and so we liked version three so much we did it twice. And uh, in this release. Uh, We've always wanted to do scaffolding, and in each release, it was just one of those things, well, we have more important. We need to get the framework right. We need to get right. these other things right. And finally, in this, uh, with this mix release, we realized, OK, now's the time to do scaffolding. And so, uh, but I was really busy with NuGet as well. And so I uh, was splitting my time between NBC and NuGet. Mm -hmm. And it was getting really hard to stay on top of things. And so I had this bright idea that uh, you know, Steve has already written this NBC scaffolding package. And he's been working on it. And I talked to our manager, and I said, uh, why didn't he own the entire uh, scaffolding experience in MVC 301, or th sorry, three tools ah, update? OK, so you just said MVC 301. Why isn't it 3.1, 3.5, 3.0? Because Scott had made the very specific point that the, the system.web.mvc didn't change. That's right. So is that why we didn't change the version number? Yes, yeah. Uh, we wanted it to be very, we originally had a code name, MVC 3.01. Uh, so Internally, we call it permanent redirect. So yeah. maybe some of, you, some of you web folks are like laughing, and everyone else is like, I don't get it. But in any case. Well, it's obscure. It is obscure, yeah. So we, uh, what was I saying? Oh, uh, 301. Yeah. <laughs> there was a 404 there in your brain. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, the idea that the version, you didn't call it 3.1. Oh, yeah, because we wanted to focus on just the tooling. Uh, we had this code name, and we uh, ran it by some insiders and MVPs to get their early feedback. And what they told us is that it caused confusion. And a lot of people get freaked out if we release in January and then again in April release another framework update with new features. Then it's all this you know, uh, figuring out, well, which version am I on? Which right. one do I need on my server? Well, people are still waiting for the MVC3 books. And someone had tweeted <laughs> earlier, uh, by the time those books come out, MVC4 will come out. Yeah. yeah. yeah may, hopefully this time around, uh, it will, there'll be a little more lead time because, uh, um, you know, I'm not going to talk about what MVC4 release dates are, but we're going to try to keep to more of a regular cadence from this point on, okay. I hope, because uh, 
to make Because you need sanity. to go in home and hang out with your family. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. So when we said add controller, that dialog box has empty controller, uh, re create, read, update, delete with Entity Framework, and yep. then just like regular uh, you know, CRUD. Yeah, that's right. And then you have a package on NuGet that I could go and say install package, say MVC scaffolding, and then what changes in that in that dialog box? Yeah, so when you install the MVC scaffolding package, that's going to add some new entries into that add controller dialog. And the additional things that it can do is, um, for example, scaffolding controllers with repositories. So if you don't want to have your data access code in line in your controllers, then uh, often the first thing that you'll do is you'll create a, a repository class, which is uh, an abstraction uh, that describes some way of accessing data, but without saying how it works, um, and split that out of your controller. So uh, instead of having you do that manually, you can use this built-in controller with repository template. And then that's what will come out when you do the add controller dialog there. Um, and as you mentioned, it's extensible. So uh, if you go ahead and create your own custom scaffolders using this package, I've got some blog posts about, up about that at the moment, then you can make those appear in the add controller dialog as well. Okay. Uh, so your custom code will run through the dialog. So what are some things that I would, might want to might change? Like I could go and say I want an hibernate or a link to SQL or yeah. a whatever uh, pattern. Yeah. Could, I, could I make a, you know, a, like Rob Connery's got a little thing called Massive that does yeah. inline SQL. I could make one of those if I wanted to. Absolutely, yeah. You could do that very easily just by changing the two Actually, templates. Massive won't work in there. Oh, yeah. OK, we've actually explicitly blocked that. Yes. It just looks if, if, if not if, Rob Connery, yeah. Yeah. then throw not implemented exception. Yeah, exactly. I think yeah. Scott Goo checked that code in. OK, <laughs> okay so I can get that. into that dialog. You can do that. And the dialog, is that just a front end to, to the back, you know, PowerShell? It's just like, it seems like we've got NuGet that I can do from the, from the, the GUI. Yeah. And I can do NuGet from the command line. I can yeah. do scaffolding yes. from the GUI. And I can do it from the PowerShell. Yes, you'll be delighted to know that it's uh, slightly more complicated than that. Um, so. Uh, the scaffolding uh, can be run through the GUI in the way that we've just talked about, and it can be run through the NuGet console, uh, which is uh, based on PowerShell. And when you extend uh, the scaffolding system with your own scaffolders based on PowerShell, you can put those in the GUI too. So when you run the built-in scaffolders, like the ones that were shown in the keynote this morning, that is not using the MVC scaffolding package because you might not have got that well, installed. Because you haven't brought it down yet. Exactly. Yeah. And your yeah. package does not ship with Exactly. MVC. Yes, it's okay. so separate. So when you, your custom things do appear there, then that is calling into the PowerShell code behind it. So you, basically, the, the add controller dialog can do both. It can talk to the PowerShell code, or it can talk to the built-in tooling in MVC3 tools update. Yeah. Now, when I do scaffold controller, and I did that in the keynote, I saw not only a controller and a bunch of views, but also a, a context class for my database. Yeah. Then the second controller, I actually saw a method get added to the context yep. rather than another file. I think a lot of people are used to code generation where you, you yep. know, create a bunch of files, but that was the first time where we actually injected in another line. Is, is that That's something right. that I could, you know, that, that kind of make, changes my perspective on what scaffolding can do. Yeah, so it, it doesn't just spit out text files, it can modify your code. So Visual Studio has this API that not a lot of people use or know about uh, called the Code Model API, which will allow you to query your solution and your projects and your files and get back some object that represents that, these code elements. And then you can navigate through them, like you navigate through the DOM in a web page with jQuery. And then you can say, like, add some more elements into the middle of this file. Um, and it, it's quite cute, because when you do it, the, the text in Visual Studio just like updates on the fly. It doesn't have to close and open the file so or anything. So it's a DOM for Visual Studio. Yeah, exactly. I, didn't have to, I don't have to recompile. It's not reflection. No, no, no. So it's just looking at the actual text in all your files and the way that Visual Studio thinks about the text internally. So for example, if you right-click on um, uh, an item and say go to definition or press F12, um, then Visual Studio has to know where that item is in all your files. So this is the, the code model that it's maintaining in memory um, of your source control, and it's a read-write system. So that's what we're using the write portion of it there to update your data context class without having to close it or anything like that. So when I uh, go into PowerShell and I type scaffold, yep. that's not really the PowerShell command. Scaffold's an alias yes. for invoke scaffolder. That's right, yeah. And I was showing a gentleman just before we started the show, I could type get scaffolder, and it basically lists out, well, here's the one that is currently assigned to view. Yes, that's right. And I thought that was really interesting, because you type scaffold controller foo, yep. scaffold view. 
I can swap those those nouns out. Can't yeah, I? that's right. Because you might want your view scaffolder to map to the Razor view scaffolder, or you might want it to map to ASPX view, or maybe you've created some other thing called Spark view or some other kind of view engine, and you want to define that that's your default for views. And so if you define that view maps to Spark view, then that will be what comes out when you scaffold a controller from then on. How do you decide what should be a GUI and what should have tooling and what shouldn't? Because I mean, I could see that you know, doing stuff in text is extremely flexible, mm -hmm. but there's a barrier to entry. And sometimes Microsoft programmers are teased for being too GUI focused. Mm -hmm. How did you decide what the controller scaffolding dialog should do and at what point they should just drop into the, the text? Uh, I think these days we've been focusing a lot more on going with the command line approach first and then figuring out what's the right GUI on top of that, and we look at what the, you know, command line tends to be geared towards more towards power users who want a lot more options at their fingertips. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for the GUI, we don't want, it's, it's kind of quick and easy, and we didn't want to put too many choices there, because that often paralyzes people when they're trying to use it. Right. So we look at what's the, what we think the mainstream scenario is, right? What are 80, you know, the 80-20 rule? What are 80% of the people going to use? What are they not going to use? And um, for the real edge cases, we figure, well, they can drop into the command line. If they really need to do that, they can you know, go install package MVC scaffolding through the dialog. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really nice about the, the way we implemented this feature is uh, you know, this is a dialog within, uh, Visual, uh, Vision, within Visual Studio tooling for MVC that uh, you know, anytime we have a drop down, I always tell people, we have a drop down and you can extend it. You can put something in there. And this kind of... Uh, this kind of continues that philosophy, but also extends it more where a lot of these things are now easily extendable out of band through NuGet. And this MVC scaffolder, you can rev this whatever speed you feel like, yep. regardless of how MVC is rev. That's right, yeah. We, we were careful when we looked at the way that the two bits of technology talk to each other to make sure that neither side was depending on a, it being a specific version of the other side. So yeah, if, if there are unexpected updates either way, then yeah, it's still going to work fine. Yeah, and and I, I'm sorry? Oh, and it's kind of the same thing we did with uh, integrating NuGet into MVC3. It's, it's not a hard dependency on NuGet 1.2. It's 1.2 and above. And so now I can upgrade MVC, uh, NuGet when the next version comes out, and MVC will get the, all the benefits of that. When someone upgrades their tooling today, for if, if I'm an ASP and an MVC3 programmer, I've got the reversion of MVC3 that came out in January, mm -hmm. and I run the installer, and you can get that at ASP.NET slash MVC. Uh, will that upgrade my NuGet installation? Your, yes. So the version that I had from you know, 1.0 of NuGet will now become 1.2. That's right. So it comes along for the ride. It comes along for the ride. And yeah. actually, if you go up to www.asp.net, either slash MVC or slash, slash web pages or slash web forms, we've got new links, new contextual links for web PI mm -hmm. that will give you all this stuff. So even if you have Visual Studio 2010 Service Pack 1, uh, there might be other tooling like IIS Express and SQL Compact and now MVC that you might want to get. So we've got a new single link, one button now. Mm -hmm. If you've got nothing on your machine, brand new machine, it'll get you all the way up to the latest stuff. Mm -hmm. if, and it'll give you Visual Web Developer Express, the free version. Yep. But if you've got VS, it won't give you the free version. It'll go and upgrade your VS. Yeah. So one button to, to rule them all. That's up <laughs> at www.asp.net. That's new today. Make sure that you send your uh, questions to hash ch9live. We'll bring them up on the big Twitter board. Just go like that. You know. Is that what we're going to do? I need to get like a Sharpie and just mess <laughs> up this board. And, uh, and we have questions for Steve and for, uh, for Phil. Steve, the, the scaffolding stuff, I noticed that it depends on something called T4. Yeah, that's so right. So you, you, you've, ex you've extended it away. Like there's the T4 scaffolder, and then there's the MVC scaffolder. That's the right. The fact that you've derived there makes me want, just on principle, to build web forms scaffolder yeah. or something else scaffolder, unless yeah. you've already done that on the plane over? <laughs> um, not on the plane, no. Uh, we, we do have a prototype of web forms scaffolding um, just to show that it can be done. And um, we'd be happy to productize that and make that something nicer if there's community demand for it. Um, and so we're kind of waiting to see how the community adopts MVC scaffolding and what kind of patterns of use they come up with and mm -hmm. how that can best fit in with web forms. And if someone else in the community wants to go ahead and make their own web form scaffolding package based on T4 scaffolding right now and put that on NuGet, then they can go ahead and do that. And if that's good enough, then maybe we don't have to and we can just advocate, you know, use that stuff because it's great. Um, but yeah, we're kind of waiting to see where we go with that. What custom scaffolders have you put up? So if someone who's watching wants to get into making their own scaffolders for either MVC or for something else, 
what beyond MVC Scaffold have you put into NuGet that they could play with? Yeah, okay. Well, um, the first thing I, I put in that was a custom scaffolding package was called Link to SQL Scaffolding. And that, um, as you can probably guess, overrides the data access mechanism uh, from Entity Framework to Link to SQL. And um, that was pretty much to demonstrate that it could be done. Um, to, you know, to prove that we've got the architecture right. Um, so if somebody wants to make an N-Hibernate scaffolding package, they can look at how the link to SQL 1 works and say, oh, you know, this is where I'm going to plug stuff in. Okay. Um, we've also got a, um, a special controller scaffolder that produces um, AJAX-powered grids based on JQ grid. So um, Ooh, if you want to know that. What's that oh. called? Uh, it's called, it's just on my blog at the moment. It's not on NuGet. So, okay. um, yeah, you can go and download that. And, that's yeah. cool it's idea. not on NuGet, it doesn't exist. Yeah, it doesn't exist, right? <laughs> if it's not on NuGet now. Okay. Yeah. So, but that's nice because, you know, instead of having all the separate views for edit, delete, and so on, you've just got one view and it's just got some JavaScript in it and it makes a nice grid and, you know, you can page and insert and update and stuff like that. So, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Cool. And um, another thing is that uh, a few weeks ago, I. Uh, at the MVP summit, uh, we were talking about how we could uh, scaffold actions uh, separately. So instead of creating an entire controller, if I just want to and have it inserted into my controller, generate the view model that it wants to use, generate a view that uses that view model, maybe generate a, a unit test class for it, generate a unit test stub for it, all in one shot. Um, and people really like that idea. So that's actually now a natively included in MVC scaffolding as well. Okay, so, we so MVC of, scaffolder, the one that we can get today yeah. in NuGet, yeah. file new project, ASP.NET MVC with the tooling update, install package MVC scaffolding, yeah. get scaffolder, I've got unit tests, I've got actions, I can scaffold my own unit tests, presumably I could make my custom ones and yeah, you can make MB unit template. or N unit yeah. or whatever makes me Absolutely. happy. Absolutely, yeah. That's pretty wow. slick. Yeah. You know this stuff? Uh, yeah, do now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, let's get some questions on the big Twitter board. Let's ask uh, Larry, the Twitter intern, to uh, hook us up here. Send us at uh, hash ch9 live for uh, questions for uh, for Phil Hack about where he bought that shirt. <laughs> um, <laughs> did you hear Scott Goo completely insult me as I walked out on stage? Yeah, that was yeah. really yeah. kind. Yeah. So mean. Why so mean, Scott Goo? Why so mean? <laughs> Actually, oh, I think I wrote that joke for him. <laughs> I had a retort, but I was afraid. I was afraid to come back. All right, we got a question on Twitter from Greg Ratner who wants to know about how EF performs on large sites. I've seen a number of large sites, uh, especially big enterprise sites, using Entity Framework. Uh, ultimately, the question to me comes down to like serialization. It's not Entity Framework itself. It's either the creation and the compilation mm. of the query, and mm -hmm. then it's the deserialization of the objects. There's some really interesting discussions going on around that on the yeah. web right now. Yeah, I, I don't really, I don't, I don't know if you know, but I, I mean, I haven't heard a whole lot from uh, the EF team would be like the right team to ask that question about what their experience has been with uh, using Entity Framework. But. What do you guys yeah. use? I thought you did Link to SQL, and I've always said I was a, a Link to SQL fan. When I was using yeah. Entity Framework 3.5, I didn't like it, so I used yeah. Link to SQL, and I only yeah. switched over to f when Entity Framework hit 4. Yeah. Because now yeah. I can't really tell a difference between 4 and Link to SQL, so I just use yeah. EF4. Yeah, I was in the same position as well. I, I did a big project on NHabinate, which I was pretty happy with, although it, it, you know, it's got its sort of rough spots. Um, and then when Link to SQL came along, that I felt was a really good fit for some of the smaller projects that I had at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was kind of, you know, have, had a bit of a, a mixed bag of technologies. Um, but since EF got to version 4, I, f I felt that suddenly become, you know, it's really fits in with my mental framework right now about how data access should work um, with the code first option. I'm really happy with it. So um, yeah, it's, it's something I'm quite happy to use now, um, whereas I wasn't so much before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got an interesting question up here from Marius Schultz who wants to know uh, what kind of the features are you thinking about for MVC4? And I don't know how much you'll be able to talk about considering we just released three with the tools update, but are those discussions happening on CodePlex, or how does the community get involved into influencing what comes into MVC4? So we have a couple places that, uh, the, probably the best place is going to our forums, uh, forums.asp.net and slash something or other. Yeah. But uh, just look for MVC in there. In your else. Uh, and, uh, so the, the MVC forums, you guys actively monitor that. Yes, the we team active, is in there. The team's in there. Uh, but uh, just, just based on feedback that we got even through the MVC3 cycle, we already have a pretty good idea of some of the big picture areas that we're going to focus on. And as you can imagine, a lot of them will focus on building the kind of really great applications that uh, we saw in the keynote. Uh, modern web applications, uh, you know, HTML5 applications, client-side, mobile, all, all AJAX, you know, all these things are areas that we're going to start to focus on and, and look into. And then at the same time, you know, uh, looking for areas where you know people have continually provided feedback, 
so uh, composability, componentization. Um, it, it's hard to say at this point you know, how many of those things we'll do because you know, there's always like a, a huge list of things. But those are the areas that we're currently investigating and thinking a lot about and uh, are certainly open to hearing feedback. You know, I've already had a few feature requests uh, just at the Open Source Fest that we had the other night. Yeah. And in some ways, NuGet is a bit of a game changer about this as well, because previously the sort of features that we would have had to wait for a, a big release for can now be packages that go out at any time. And, and the kind of the barrier to releasing something like that is a little lower. So um, stuff can come out from Microsoft and from the community more rapidly than yeah. it would do before. And, that, and it doesn't sort of need to scare you because you don't have to install the package if you don't want it, right? You're just yeah. pulling the stuff that you want and you compose together the sort of framework that you want. Uh, rather than just being delivered this massive thing that has to work one particular way. Yeah, and that was one of the reason. That was one of the things we were most excited about when we were developing NuGet and thinking about the future of MVC. And you know, we have these uh, preview releases every month or every two months in the past. And now we're thinking, well, wouldn't it be great if those previews were just if they were framework oriented, put them out as NuGet packages, or or if we had like uh, you know our MVC futures library where we kind of speculate on features and, right. and kind of hack together uh, different ideas for people to try out. We could publish those as That's a great. I, mean, I think it'd be great to be able to have MVC 3 and do that in my day job and then be able to go and say install package MVC futures, you know, daily, daily builds or whatever yeah. and just play around with whatever's coming in the next version. I think that it's interesting to see the way people are, are using NuGet packages in ways that I don't think any of us thought about, right? I mean, the initial idea was I got a DLL on some assets, I zip it up and I make it available. And I was able to go using some, uh, some automation stuff that, that I'd learned from you, Steve, to go and write uh, a web forms to MVC uh, hybrid thing that mm -hmm. actually automates Visual Studio and unloads the project and yeah. updates. You know, I, I didn't see that coming. Uh, just literally an hour ago, I used NuGet.server. Uh -huh. File yeah. new project, hit enter, install package NuGet.server, run. And then I've got a little tiny read-only NuGet uh, server. Yeah. Uh, and then I saw another amazing one yesterday that I won't, I won't mention the name because I want to save it for my overview talk. <laughs> so I'm going to say it. No, go, go ahead. But no, no, go ahead. Really, really amazing stuff from, from profilers and things like Elma to inspectors and utilities. It's not just about laying DLLs down. Yeah. We've got scaffolders giving new commands to Visual Studio. We've got, I mean, you know, yeah, extending dialogues. Yeah, one of the nice things, I mean, the, the creativity that's come out of the community with NuGet packages has gone way beyond what I could expect, right? And I always expect a lot, but it always goes exceeds my expectations. So that's really great. One of the really nice things that's kind of a, uh, what's the, I hate to use the word synergy, but more of a. Wow. Con, not, I was wondering how long it was going to take yeah, you said synergy. No, 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 not synergy. synergy. What's the convergence or, or just like good serendipity? <laughs> No, uh, that was just like Shift F7 in Word right there. Thesaurus, <laughs> yeah. uh, synergy. Hit the convergence. thesaurus, yeah. No, it, it is a little bit of serendipity that um, we have a lot of great APIs that came out in ASP.NET 4 mm -hmm. that uh, made our underlying platform so much more flexible that you can do things uh, in NuGet packages that you wouldn't be able to do before. Exactly. Even if we had NuGet in 3.5. Uh, for example, pre-app start, um, where you can register and call into APIs that will allow you to add HTTP modules dynamically through code. Right. And you know, let that sink in a little bit when you think about if you've ever tried to do that in the past, you know, HTTP, HTTP modules were part of IIS. And so IIS had to know about it even before ASP.NET was loaded into memory. Exactly. And now you can uh, call into a kind of a hidden API, but you can dynamically register HTTP modules. I cannot say that word. And you can uh, use a, a package called Web Activator, mm -hmm. which takes advantage of pre app start. And that allows you to register code that's going to run uh, way, way, way early, right before the application itself is right. even started. It's a way of almost editing your global ASAX if you're doing it in a separate file. A really good yeah, example yeah. of that is the Entity Framework SQL Server Compact, yeah. which yeah. actually registers itself as the default. Uh, yeah, exactly. Database. So you can modify global AS ASAX without modifying global ASAX, right? Exactly. And modify the pipeline and, and compose these app togethers out of these different NuGet packages in a way that you couldn't do before in our framework. And so that's why we see some of these things like the packages that will not be named that uh, until your talk. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> well, that's also, why we see packages like that coming out, because yeah, now yeah. they have these oh, yeah, APIs to build this, against. This is going to blow your mind. I mean, 
they, they basically handed me my talk on a platter. With this package. <laughs> um, and another good example is IIS Express, which I don't think enough, I mean, you can go tools options and say, use IIS Express for all future ones and your life will just be better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like um, I was noticing when I was working on a web matrix project that I wanted it to go to slash and it kept going to default.cshtml. So I wrote a little one-line server real, you know, URL rewrite. Mm -hmm. This URL rewrite's included, yeah. and it's part of system.webserver in the web config. And I solved my problem in a line of code, and it wouldn't have worked in Cassini yeah. in the Visual Studio web developer. So I mean, actually having full IIS there, having the flexibility to have you know, these modules come and go, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, again, I keep saying coming back to Lego. I know, it's a <laughs> I know people hate it when I reuse metaphors and stuff, but yeah. the Lego pieces are the right size now. The, the other piece I really like is SQL Server Compact being in the box now, yeah. or, or being a, as a NuGet package that we can easily pull in. Uh, just having an embeddable, well, not an embedded, but uh, in proc database is right. really nice. Something and that I can just, deployable. Exactly, sure. that I can just copy to my web server. Is, last question, we've only got about two minutes left, but has it been hard to convince groups at Microsoft that were not involved in NuGet, Entity Framework, SQL Server Compact, to ship their stuff that way? Because I bet few people are downloading Entity Framework or SQL Server Compact that way. They're using NuGet to get these things. I know I am. I mean, I have the tooling, but the way I get the DLL is NuGet. There was initial reluctance in some groups because, you know, they're already, hard, everyone's always hard pressed to ship, right? And they're like, oh, my schedule, I don't have time to add yet another deployment vehicle. And then NAD, we got Entity Framework to do it, and we said, well, you know, we're going to include you in NBC, that's mm -hmm. going to help you guys out. But even before then, we had their package up, and they got 100,000 downloads in like no time. Yeah. And now other groups see that, and they're like, wow, that's more than they got through any other deployment vehicle that they had at the time. So now we have other teams, you know, emailing me all the time, hey, tell me about NuGet, how do we ship with NuGet, you know, what, you know, what can we do with NuGet? So mm -hmm. it, the tune has changed a lot, I think, simply because people are realizing that it's a, a lot nicer way to ship framework libraries or libraries uh, than what we've done before. It Nobody is. wants to run an MSI to install an SDK that then someone else doesn't have available. Thank you, Phil Hack, Steve Shannison, everybody from Channel, H, Channel Line Live. Get ready, people. Stack Overflow is next. Tell your mama. Hide your husbands. Tweet it. See you in a minute. Bye-bye. <laughs>